Hello, everyone. Welcome to the pre-med experience. I'm so happy you could attend the event live with us. Most of you probably know me from Instagram or TikTok, but if I will link all that info in the comments. Um, I try to post helpful stuff for pre-meds and tips from a medical student perspective. So definitely check me out. It's at White Coats and Corgis if that's something of interest to you. And yeah, I'm so happy this event is finally here. I've been working on this for almost six months now, and I can't wait for you all to meet the amazing presenters I've gathered here for us today. Uh, for me, the goal of this event was to increase accessibility to experts who can help you get into medical school and eventually reach your goal of becoming a doctor. So we have some incredible incredibly knowledgeable experts speaking today from MCAT tutors to admissions committee members to even medical school deans. So please take advantage of their wisdom and their advice. Next, we're gonna hear from two physicians who have served on medical school admissions committees. Um, they are going to show us a little bit about what medical schools are looking for in 2023 and how you can make yourself stand out as an applicant. There will also be a short Q&A at the end of the presentation. So feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A box. And now please join me in welcoming Dr. Renee Marinelli and Dr. Ziggy Udiano. Um, Ziggy, I'm gonna hit you up with one that, this is not one, this is a, uh, compilation of multiple questions that I keep okay. seeing out here is talk a little bit about a non-traditional applicant and how that helps or hinders an application perhaps. Yeah, well, I've worked with a lot of non-traditional applicants who are maybe, you know, older, have had different careers prior to that. And I think that is a huge asset, basically. I think, uh, I think you know, med schools welcome non-traditional applicants because you have a lot of, you know, you have a unique knowledge and skill set that you can bring from, you know, your prior career, your prior background, and all that. And so, I think, you know, I think, like anything else, of course, like all the other applicants, whether you're traditional or non-traditional, you have to, you know, optimize every aspect of the application. I think one of the big things, of course, that differentiates you as a non-traditional applicant, maybe from the more traditional one, is that you know, in the personal statement, uh, you know, you have to really explain why, you know, if you're making a career change or something like that, why you're doing that, basically. You know, what is the impetus for that? Um, there, you know, there has to be a real strong narrative behind that, basically, and that's why you know, branding and thinking about a unique narrative is very, very important, basically. But I think it's. Uh, uh, you know, it's a huge asset, basically. And one of the things to think about as you even apply is to, you know, sort of do sort of this retrospective analysis, you know, on your career, on your sort of unique background, and think about the unique skills and knowledge that you have gained from that that would be applicable uh, as a future medical school student, as a future physician. And that's something that you would even be able to write about, you know, in your primary, uh, in your personal statement, in your secondary, something to talk about uh, during an interview. I think that is a great way to help make you stand out. So yeah, definitely don't see that as a negative. But again, like with any applicant, it doesn't matter, traditional, non-traditional, you just got to do the best and optimize every facet of it. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one thing I was seeing um, a couple questions out there about people that are non-traditional applicants and as in their career changers. Um, I think I even saw a question of somebody that was a physician's assistant that wants to apply to medical school. And I mean, mm. I totally agree. Ziggy, I think you can really, really use your non-traditional background as an advantage and really show those unique skills, your perspective, your life experience, your professionalism, maturity. I mean, so many things can really work for you as a non-traditional applicant. The one thing too that I will say though is making sure that you, if you, especially if you're a career changer, is you're showing your true interest in becoming a physician. I think mm -hmm. sometimes medical schools will see career changers as like, well, are you sure you want to do this? I mean, you have like this whole, you know, 10 years background in X, Y, and Z. Like, are you sure now you want to stop that and go four years of medical school, three to seven years of residency before you're in your next <laughs> career? <laughs> So, I mean, I think it's important to emphasize that too, that, you know, you have taken the steps and that you're, you're very much ready for it. And, um, you're, you're committed to this path, um, yeah. which I think is important to show. And that's definitely something to write about in the personal statement and to emphasize on an interview as well. Yes. Um, 
Can I can I add one thing yeah. real quickly? Yeah. yeah. And, and just sort of think, you know, right along the lines of what uh, Renee was saying, I, even to be more granular, it's not even thinking about why you want to do medicine, I would say. I would argue you should also think at a very granular, granular level about why you want to be a physician, basically, because there's a lot of different types of wonderful healthcare providers who have different types of added value, basically. And, you know, the question could be, you know, whether you're traditional or non-traditional, you know, why not be a PA? Why not be a nurse? practitioner why not be a social worker they're mm. all amazing healthcare providers and yep. so that's something you have to really think at a uh, you know a granular level at least speaking from experience with my own clients a lot of the times one of the reasons they want to be a physician versus other types is uh, sort of the the buck stops with them so to speak they have the ultimate responsibility for better or worse for patient care basically yeah yeah absolutely I think I think that's a great great point um there's a lot of questions here about just kind of clarifying some of the extracurricular activities and we mm -hmm. could spend again a, a whole webinar on extracurricular activities but i'm going to just try to touch on some of the points that mm -hmm. people are um wanting some clarification on so um there's a question out there what is shadowing and great question let's start there um shadowing is basically being a fly on the wall um, and watching people do their work. And so you can shadow in multiple different professions, but when we're talking about pre-meds and people that want to go to medical school, it's shadowing physicians. So you are talking to physicians and getting into their office or to their hospital or to wherever they're working, could be virtually as well. And you're basically just watching them perform their duties and seeing patients. Um, it can be a little boring at times because you're you're not really having an active role in it, but I mean, it is something that's really important because if you're, you know, 18, 19 years old and you're trying to figure out your career path, do you really know what it's like to become a physician? And I would argue, no, even if your parents are physicians or you have lots of people that you know that are physicians, you don't really know what it's going to be like for your own career. And it's hard to know, but one of the ways to really help you know what it's going to be like is to watch people in that career and to sit there and observe them and see what some of their challenges are, see what their day's like, you know, what are the patients like that they're seeing? How do they have discussions with their patients? <laughs> What are the different specialties in medicine? Which ones are in the hospital? Which ones are in an outpatient setting? There's so many different nuances to the clinical setting that I think it really helps you to dive into it and understand pieces of medicine and what it's like to be a physician. And medical schools want to see that you've spent the time doing that. Um, another question that we get a lot about extracurricular activities, and I see some of these out there, is okay, how many hours of this do I need? And so for shadowing, I usually see competitive applicants about 50 to 100 hours of shadowing. And that I think is best when it's shadow shadowing multiple physicians across different specialties. So what I mean by that is, you know, maybe you're 15 hours at a pediatrician's office, 20 hours with obst obstetrician, you know, 20 hours with a primary care physician, you're shadowing multiple physicians. So you kind of see, you know, a, a cross section of medicine. You're not just seeing one little area, but you're seeing multiple areas. Um, for, let me, before I dive into more of the hours, I'm going to hit on another question out there is kind of like, well, what about shadowing versus clinical activities? And yes, these are very different. So with a clinical activity, what medical schools really want to see is they want to see you interacting with patients and working alongside other healthcare practitioners. So that can be like hospital volunteering, that can be clinical research, that can be working as like a medical assistant or an EMT. Um, basically, you're kind of taking a role in patient care, whereas shadowing, again, you're a fly on the wall, you're not really being, you're not really act interacting with people <laughs> too much, you're really just observing the doctor and you may have some conversations about being a physician and things that you're seeing and stuff like that, but you're really being, you know, a uh, observer. So with clinical activities, you're trying to take a more active role. And I think especially important is interacting with patients. When you start medical school, that should not be the first time you ever have a discussion with a patient or talk with a patient. You should have some experience beforehand talking with patients and caring for them. So 
For clinical activities, volunteering and research, I usually say you need to have at least 200 hours of those. And I, I, that's like at least. There's not a lot of good data out there, but this is more from what we've seen with competitive applicants. Um, so at least 200 hours, and I would say somewhere around 500 hours of each of those categories is going to make you really, really competitive. Mm -hmm. um, no. Any other thoughts there, Ziggy? Yeah, the, the only thing I wanted to add in terms of the clinical experiences, you know, as, as uh, Renee mentioned, you know, a very common way. Uh, I think one of the most common ways that people get clinical experience is, you know, volunteering at a hospital, basically, which is great. You know, often they're greeting patients, uh, helping transport patients, bringing blankets. That's really great. That you know, they're, they're, any any experience you get is valuable, of course. Uh, one of the issues with volunteering in a hospital, I would say, is that so many people do it. So many applicants do it. Everyone and their mom does that, basically. And so one of the things you want to try to do is differentiate yourself in terms of your clinical experience. So if there is a way to do scribing, EMT, hospice volunteer, clinical research, that's something that I often recommend to my clients if that's a possibility, because the level of interaction, the level of responsibility is just a little bit um, a little bit higher than when you do hospital volunteering, basically. Now, that being said, if you don't have the opportunity to do those other things that I mentioned, absolutely still do hospital volunteering, uh, but just think about maybe ways within that hospital volunteering that you can differentiate yourself from other people. Mm -hmm. So that helps make you a little bit more unique. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see here. Um, there's so many good questions. And again, I'm trying to find some that are, uh, you know, really encompass a few of the mm -hmm. questions answer them as many as you know as possible um Ziggy I'm going to pass this one to you <clears throat> how do you recommend getting close to professors to get letters of recommendation I think mm, that's a great question that is a good and you know this is usually from non-science you know majors who often uh have to get a science uh letter of recommendation so I think there's a few ways to do this okay number one do really well in the class I think that's a good way that's a good start basically <laughs> number two you know whenever there's a review session, I would try to go to all the review sessions. Even if you feel like you know the material well, you wanna to go to the review sessions, have genuinely authentic, you know, genuine uh, quality questions that you might ask at the review session. You know, so that shows that you're, you know, you, you care, you're trying to participate. Number three, of course, all professors have office hours basically. So again, you don't wanna just drop by to chit chat basically. You know, anyone can <laughs> see, but you wanna come with again, genuine questions that, you know, you really wanna understand the material, something like that. Um, so I think that's a good way to kind of do it, you know, on a periodic basis, you know, you don't want to be camping out there basically, but, you know, come periodically. And then I would say the last way, one of the best ways, you know, if you're actually doing very well in a class is try to be a TA for the, for the professor. That's somewhere where you can really demonstrate, um, you know, your strengths, your, your ability to be responsible, uh, to manage, you know, uh, students. And that's often when they can see, you know, sort of be, be able to write the most granular, detailed, uh, you know, letter of evaluate, evaluation for you later on, should you ask about something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's all about establishing those relationships early on. And it can be tough if you're in a big school and you have like 300 students in your class, but it, it takes that extra effort. And I think it's important too to start thinking about that early. You know, mm -hmm. so many people we see are applying to medical school that spring and they're like, I need to get letters of recommendation. I don't know who to get them from. And it's like, well, probably should have been thinking about this earlier. And so starting with those relationships and building them early on, like even if you're a freshman, sophomore, because maybe you'll take another class from that professor, or maybe you can develop a relationship and you can do research with somebody, you know, and so you've taken the course and now you've done research with them, like things like that is really how you can start to build it. And then when it comes time to get those letters of recommendation, it's just, it's just natural. And they're almost expecting you to be asking mm. for one from them. Um, there's a lot, a lot of questions from some international students and Canadian applicants. So I'm gonna touch on that just briefly. For anybody that is an international applicant to US medical schools, I really, really recommend that you reach out to us and chat with us. 
Um, because point blank, it's harder. It's harder to get into medical school if you are an international applicant. Um, because medical schools are really prioritizing US students um, in the United States. So um, it is just so, so important to get some special help here because you're kind of up against a higher um, competitive applicant pool. It's very much more selective for international students. Not all schools even accept international applicants and the schools that do accept international applicants, it's maybe like five out of their class of a hundred plus. So it, it, it's just really tough. You really have to have great MCAT, really good grades, standout extracurricular activities. Um, so all of those things like that we talked about need to even be to the higher level. Um, so I, I really think like if you're an international applicant, it's not impossible, but it's hard. So I would really recommend getting specific advice. And I, I feel like I'm kind of shortchanging that question, but it's, oh, it's kind of a loaded question. So I would say, you know, talk to somebody that's an expert, talk to us, a med school coach and get some help on how to really make sure that you're, um, becoming as competitive as possible. If you're international, um, Ziggy, anything to add there? I know that was very, very brief. <laughs> no, in all honesty, I don't. I think you kind of co covered the quick and dirty of what needs to be said about it. Basically, I, I think it requires such a more detailed conversation. Basically, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, there is a question, Ziggy. I'll I'll throw this one to you. Um, and I, you know, we get this a lot. Is how do you suggest people go about getting shadowing experiences, clinical experiences, research experiences? I know I'm kind of throwing these all into one boat and they're very different. Um, but yeah. I, I think a lot of people struggle, like, where do I even yeah. start? Like, yeah. do you have any suggestions for them? Yeah, I have a few suggestions. You know, number one, start with your pre-med or your pre-health department or advisor, however you may feel about that person, basically, sometimes they get a knock against them, basically, but you want to try to maintain that relationship. They often have those kind of information and resources, uh, special programs are even sometimes set up with the school, basically, to get clinical uh, experience, maybe shadowing. Another one would be, of course, if you're part of a pre-med organization, basically, you know, at your school, they oftentimes have resources and connections, basically. Third would be family and friends. Let me tell you, connections make a big make a big difference in your life. I've learned that the hard way. So that's something to take <laughs> advantage of, basically. And then the fourth way, you know, uh, for better or worse, is old-fashioned cold emails, basically. Uh, sometimes you just got to do the research, see what's out there, and reach out to people. There's a whole art to reaching out to people, which I'm not going to get into. But I think those are the four mm -hmm. main ways that you can sort of start, hopefully, getting some success with finding these opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, like if you are in a city and you have a teaching hospital in the area, that's a great place to start. And what I mean is a teaching hospital is usually a hospital that has a medical school or at least a residency is associated with it because those, those hospitals are usually more willing to take on volunteers and people that are, you know, learning because it is a teaching hospital. So definitely start there. And then like you said, Ziggy, like cold emailing, cold calling, that can be tough. Um, but I, the people that are successful are the ones that have really, really pushed through and um, <laughs> have just sent tons of emails, called a lot, followed up on opportunities. Those are the people that find really good experiences. So like when you want to give up, don't just keep trying to find them. 